Are fast and slow brain waves the key to tinnitus? The answer to this question can help us generate predictive profiles and recommended treatments to help you know your best solution for your tinnitus. So the answer today comes from Dr. Payman Ajamian out of MRC Institute of Hearing Research, Nottingham, UK. Dr. Ajamian has his research focus on the mechanisms of tinnitus, hearing loss, and related psychological issues. I like this paper because he recognized some of the weaknesses in other tinnitus research that made too many assumptions. So let's discuss what synchrony is. Basically, it's neurons communicating or firing at the same time. If you have just a few, it's still synchrony, but it's hard to measure it. To measure this activity on MEG or more commonly on EEG, we need a whole bunch of neurons communicating their signal in the same direction and the neurons need to be firing at the same time. Now all these individual signals are added together to come up with measurable scalp surface signals. Even then, the electrical activity may come in seemingly random spikes, but we found that if we organize the activity into groupings based on how frequently the electrical impulses arrive, we can begin to make more sense out of it. That's where we come up with the gamma, the fastest, beta, alpha, theta, and delta brain waves. Researchers have found that certain brain waves predominate in certain states of wakefulness. Two episodes ago, we talked about maladaptive synchrony and maladaptive synchrony being allowed to generate from a lack of braking mechanisms, right? So neurons start firing and just keep getting themselves and nearby neurons more worked up, not being able to break their activity. In that case, it was due to a neuron structure and biochemical issue. In this research paper, there's a different explanation. And the explanation that's emphasized um, will be interesting to find out. Keep in mind, there's, more, there's likely more than one cause at play. So there's likely more than one correct answer for the cause. And the solution? Well, that's why I'm always talking about synergy, because there's more than one cause and more than one solution. So the explanation emphasized in this research paper, paper is called Thalamocortical dysrhythmia. Wow, that's fancy talk. It's just shorthand for altered communication back and forth between the thalamus, the deep brain here, that should relay sound signals but doesn't receive them when there's some hearing loss, and the cortex, the surface brain here. In this case, specifically the temporal lobe of the cortex. So that's thalamocortical and the dis of dysrhythmia just means bad. So thalamocortical dysrhythmia means bad rhythm or bad communication between these brain areas. The thalamocortical dysrhythmia theory predicts a few findings that Dr. Ajamian put to the test in this study. So the theory says, number one, lack of sound input to the thalamus, the deep brain, will lead to decreased excitation of the thalamus, right? You don't stimulate something, then it doesn't get um, stimulated, it's not active. So normally it would send out, the thalamus would send out fast, like a bunny rabbit, um, these fast brain waves, but now it slows its input waves into the delta theta speed range like a turtle. Then number two, this less frequent, more slow wave activation of the cortex leads to a decreased breaking or less inhibition of nearby neurons. Neurons normally decrease the activity of the neurons nearby seemingly to focus or clarify the meaning of the signal. So this is called surround inhibition. So less breaking around the edge would lead to an increased high frequency brain waves around these edges of the slowed region. Then this increased high frequency activity around the edges leads to the increased perception of tinnitus. So that's how it's supposed to work. Now, unfortunately, none of these details of this theory can be tested directly because technology is not high resolution enough. But good researchers find ways to learn what seems impossible. Think of the human genome and the submicroscopic complexity that was unraveled in that. Of course, the job of the researcher and the clinician is to determine if a research finding, like synchrony, should be the focus of our treatment. Years ago, Egermont, um, Dr. Egermont discovered that animals who had hearing loss due to noise trauma developed spontaneous neuron firing and synchronized neuron activity. So it seemed obvious that this was the means to diagnose tinnitus. Unfortunately, there were still questions. 
As you might imagine, it's hard to know if a cat or a rat has tinnitus, which is what many of these researchers were using in the early brain studies, and many still do. In much the same way, it's still difficult to understand or untangle some of the data details in humans as well. For certain, we know EEG electrical signals are different in people with tinnitus that have hearing loss. But is it the hearing loss or the tinnitus causing the changes? And that's where this very well-designed study comes in. They tested people who have tinnitus and those who do not in combination with both those who have hearing loss and those who do not. The most significant limitation of the study was the small number, only 22 people. Otherwise, it was quality. About half had pure tone tinnitus, while the other half had either ringing or hissing perception. So what did they find? The results seemed to disprove some details of the thalamocortical dysrhythmia theory. But even though a number of others have found the rabbit high waves, the high frequency gamma activity, strongly related to tinnitus perception, no increased rabbit waves were found in this study. They also seem to disprove that hearing loss always causes more turtle brain waves, the slow, the increased in slow delta theta activity. But this research did uncover new insights, like only those participants with hearing loss and tinnitus had increased slow wave, the delta theta activity, specifically in the right temporal lobe. So there is a specific EEG signature for this group of tinnitus sufferers which is the largest group. And number two, the next finding was related to masking. Masking is playing a sound almost identical to one's tinnitus and because of that added sound causing a decrease in the perceived loudness of one's tinnitus. So there's an added sound but you notice the internal tinnitus less. They showed that masking tinnitus led to a decreased delta activity in the majority of tinnitus participants who experienced masking. So that's just another signature of tinnitus which is great. Now the researchers seem to be perplexed by the subgroup of people who had tinnitus but no hearing loss. Well, they just propose that they must have some hearing loss even if it's ever so slight. Well, we know about this group. This is likely the muscle toxicity trigger point group. We'll discuss that in a later episode. So it seems that tinnitus in those with hearing loss is related to increased slow wave, the delta theta activity, in the temporal lobe, especially on the right, and decreasing the perception of tinnitus seems to decrease the slow wave delta theta activity. Now, to answer the original question, is brain synchrony the key to tinnitus? Well, no, this research showed that altered brain waves, altered brain activity synchrony or altered oscillations don't cause tinnitus, but they can be used to measure tinnitus. Now, remember, there were only 22 people in this study, so this could all be wrong, theoretically, but it would be great study design. It is a great study design, um, and it should be repeated with larger groups, and it would take a more robust study to change the conclusions of this well-designed study. So what can you use now from this study? Well, we can use the tinnitus brainwave signature if you need an objective diagnosis. It appears that tinnitus can be accurately measured with EEG when using the appropriate software in those who also have hearing loss. So I'll give you some links below for some uh, doctors who perform EEG. So future applications. So we can build off this ability to measure tinnitus. This is exciting. So we can build off this ability to measure tinnitus to more frequently and more accurately measure what helps reduce tinnitus. So we're looking for solutions, right? So if we use the most modest, if we use the um, uh, modestly priced, public friendly, wearable EEG units, like we discussed in previous episodes, combined with a tinnitus research app, we could gather real-time, really useful information that could provide more personalized solutions for your tinnitus. For example, you put on the wearable EEG head unit, plug it into your phone or other device, start the app and follow the directions. It starts to measure your personal tinnitus brainwave signature as you're taken through a series of sounds and activities. Your brainwaves and responses are logged, overlaid on the activities you completed and the profile you already filled out, then this is where the instant power comes in. Your profile and data are compared to that of others and the algorithm is used to generate predictive profiles and recommended treatments to help you know the best solution for you and to help us find and develop the best combinations of tinnitus therapies for others. 
Now that's my dream. In the next episode, we'll unravel another mystery. It turns out that the cause of the tinnitus sound and the increased brainwave activity is not coming from where it appears to be coming from. So stay tuned for that. So I'd like to know your thoughts. Please leave a comment or request a review of a particular research study. And to stay connected to tinnitus research and therapy, application to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And to be notified of new therapies and video postings, click the bell and subscribe to our email newsletter at tinnitusenergy.com. Thank you and may God bless you.